Ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome, please, Neil Tobin. Thank you very, very much indeed. And since I don't anticipate getting a bigger hand than that for the rest of the night, in conclusion, let me say um, that you're all very welcome. It's nice to see so many old familiar faces. Well, old faces anyway. Um, we, this is going to be an evening, despite the start, of moral and educational entertainment. Uh, we are going out to better you and make you better people. Uh, and for that reason, here beginneth the first lesson. Geography. Ireland, the geographers tell us, is an island. It's 300 miles long and 150 miles thick. <laughs> and it is inhabited by an admixture of races. You have Celts, Danes, Normans, Saxons, Anglo-Saxons, Huguenots, Palatines, Orangemen, Scotsmen, and a number of subspecies, <laughs> such as Yalabellies, <laughs> Sheep Stealers, <laughs> Heron Stranglers, Stone Throwers, Cute cork whores. <laughs> and me and Kevin bastards. <laughs> but But easily the most entertaining or the most interesting of these subspecies are the Dublin men. Now almost a vanishing race, but still with us in sufficient numbers to man the terraces of Hill 16 in Croke Park, from which advantageous position they throw toilet rolls at the referee. For this reason they are known as the Jacks. <laughs> now, the most interesting characteristic of a true Dublin man is his capacity for indignation. A Dublin man would rather be indignant than happy any day of the week. And I'll give you a few examples. Take the man who was cycling home for his lunch one day and he was passing up uh, Tara Street near the fire brigade station when he saw men running around with hoses and carrying out fire drill. So he got down off at the bike <laughs> and he looked on very approvingly at all this carry on. Until somebody pulled the wrong lever and a jet of water shot out of a hose, hit him in the chest, sent him spinning across the street and left the bike in smithereens on the other side. So he got up, wiped himself down, looked at the fireman and said, Jeez, you wouldn't do it to me if I was on fire! <laughs> Another man from Ring's End who had the same sort of disposition worked all his life as a fitter or a plumber or at least in some job that never necessitated wearing anything but dungarees or dungarains. And uh, coming towards the end of his working life he won a lot of money in the football pools and he decided that he would go on a world cruise. But as the date of his departure approached some of his friends began to worry because he didn't seem to be making any preparations. And one of them came to him and he said, Listen, isn't it about time you're getting some gear for this trip of yours? I mean, uh, you're always wearing them dungarines. Surely to God you're not going to go around the world in dungarines. So I don't like know. I was thinking I might get a suit, but a few weeks I'd be wearing it. It wouldn't be worth me while. I'd only have to take it off when I come back, you know. Well, there might be no harm if I was to get a new set of dungarines. So he got the new set of dungarines, and on his first evening at sea, he was promenading up and down the first-class deck when he heard the sound of music and dancing coming from the first-class lounge, and he went over to investigate. But as he did, the steward stepped forward and said, I'm awfully sorry, sir, but this is the first-class lounge. He said, but I'm a first-class passenger. No, no, sir, we don't want any trouble, do we? That's it, come along. <laughs> And he got him by the elbow and he led him below deck. But later on they checked the, the, the list of passengers and they found he was a first class passenger and instructions were given that amends should be made immediately. So the steward came back to him and he said, 
Captain's compliments, sir. Captain will be awfully pleased if you would dine with him this evening. So what kind of a ship is this? First of all, you wouldn't let me into the dance. And now you want me to take me meals with the crew? We have had, as you know, a recession in this country. I use the past tense advisedly because uh, it's gone now. <laughs> to America. <laughs> and, uh, but be, before it left, it, it left a trail of, of havoc all throughout the country. And um, one place that was hit very badly was Cork, uh, because Ford's closed their factory there. And one man who had been working for them for many years decided he wasn't going to leave without uh, a few souvenirs of his association with the firm. So on his last day at work, he began to help himself to little bits and pieces. From this little uh, workbench into that pocket, and from that toolbox into that pocket, and from that conveyor belt into this pocket, and then down his trousers, and up his gansey, and into his inside pockets, and into the socks. And the result was that at the end of the day, he waddled out of the factory, bulging like the Michelin man. And two of his mates were walking behind him, and I said, Just look at your ree. He's walking very funny, isn't he? He's very romantic, he look in. Is he sick? I know, no, he's all right. In fact, I'd safely say no. If you gave him a push, he'd nearly start. <laughs> and this recession, as you know, it caused gloom and doom everywhere. One man in the Midlands was so upset that he went to the doctor and, uh, well, it's a psychiatrist, really. And the psychiatrist said, yes, yes, the gloom and the doom. He said, well, it's not only that, doctor. It's more of a personal matter, really. Like and what about, what is it? He, well, he said, it's the missus. And he said, and what about her? Well, I tell you this, she treats me like a dog. <laughs> I see. Well, get on the couch there. But sure, that's the point. I'm not allowed on the couch. <laughs> But as I say, this recession hit everywhere, hit Dublin very badly. The corporation found they had no money whatsoever to carry out any sort of improvements on corporation property. And one man kept ringing them up every day. He said, listen, when are you going to do something about the cracks in my walls? And he got no joy at all. He ring again. There's cracks in the ceiling now. Still no joy. So finally he rang, there's cracks in the jacks. And this seemed to interest them more, so they <laughs> sent somebody out to see him. Not that he was going to do anything, but I mean, got him out of the office for the morning anyway. And he arrived at the house and said, Are you the man of the corporation? Come in here, let's show you. Look at that ceiling. Look at the cracks in that ceiling. Look at the bleeding map of Ireland it is. And look at the walls. Look at the walls. Look, look, look they're powdered in the sun. It's like dandruff it is. Did you ever see a wall with dandruff? And why don't I show you the bathroom? Come in here, let's show you the bathroom. And as they passed by the stairs, the inspector heard a sort of a snapping noise and he turned and there to his astonishment under the stairs he saw a mouse trap with a trout caught in it. <laughs> so he called the tenant, he said, excuse me, what? <laughs> oh, that, oh yeah, never mind the dampness, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> now, Another section of the corporation were so strapped for money that they, they really had to do something desperate to keep up their public image. And they scraped through every account they could find in order to build some sort of, start some sort of a building program. And they managed to raise 3,000 pounds from various accounts. And uh, the only building they could manage for that naturally would be a very small one. And the only one they could think of was a public convenience and a very small one at that. So, but anyway, they invited tenders for this job and they only got three, uh, three applications. 
And the first man in with his bid was a Dublin builder. And they said, well, what's your bid? Well, he said, I'll tell you the truth now. I want to go on the baller, you know. <laughs> you know I want to go on the bottom of my arse, like. <laughs> Applying. I know that is a crude expression, but in view of the nature of the building you have in mind, I think it's an appropriate one. <laughs> Well, anyway, I know that you are stuck for the thing, and that's like I'm a double man myself, and I don't want to see you embarrassed or anything like that, so I will do the job for three grand. Because I know you have only three grand anyway. I mean, I got that on the grapevine. I said, well, that's very interesting, very kind of you, but uh, we have to have a breakdown on these figures for our, our accounts. Oh, yeah, well, I suppose that we, uh, be a thousand pound for materials, to be a thousand pound for labour, and to be a thousand pound profit. I think that's a reasonable markup, you know. I mean, you wouldn't get much better than that, you know. I mean, no, all right, like this, we'll let you know. So the second man in was a builder from Cavan. And they said, uh, and what is it? He said, oh, um, six thousand pound. <laughs> said, six thousand. Yeah, six thousand pound. And they said, and um, what's, uh, what is the breakdown in that? Well, there'll be £2,000 profit, anyhow, for a start. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you can divide the rest of, like, 2000 for labour or material or something like that. Anyway, 6000 a good round sum. You know, like, you wouldn't get the better of that now. And I'd be only able to hold, hold that now to Friday, you know. I couldn't hold that. <laughs> because, you see... With all the inflation and everything, you know what I mean? Like, just, all right, I'll, we'll let you know. So the last uh, man in with his bid was a builder from Cork. And they said, and what is your... Oh, nine thousand pounds. <laughs> nine. Yeah, nine thousand pounds. Hmm. And uh, what is the breakdown on those figures? Well, um, there'll be three thousand for you. <laughs> 3,000 for me, and we give the job to the Dublin fella. <laughs> and what I find so refreshing about that story is that people think it's a joke. Um, but anyway, this recession, as I say, has, has gone on, but we, we'll leave that for the moment because I want to return to the educational uh, side of our little evening. And we're going to have a short lesson in Irish. Now, don't let this upset you too much if your Irish is rusty because it's a very brief one. Uh, Deneen's Irish English Dictionary is arguably the funniest book ever written. As a perusal of any definition in it will persuade you very quickly. Take the simple word girl spelt G-A-E-L, but pronounced Goyle, as in Fine Gael. <laughs> and Deneen defines Goyle as an Irishman, a Highlander, a Catholic, so you can take your choice there, but then he has the adjective Goyleach, which he says means Irish, Irish-speaking, Gaelic, simple, <laughs> unsophisticated, <laughs> easygoing, common, native. Now, as against that, Chambers' 20th Century Dictionary defines Irish as characteristic of Ireland, self-contradictory, blundering, bull-making. <laughs> Castle's German Dictionary gives us the Irlander, a bog-trotter. While modern British scientific thinking defines an Irishman as a complex mechanism for transforming Guinness into urine. <laughs> Which uh, any Murphy drinker will tell you is a superfluous exercise anyway, but... I want to talk now briefly as well on another very educational subject, and that is the subject of sex. Not because of any special knowledge, but uh, rather like the woman that went to confession because I like talking about it, Father. <laughs> and it has been said that among the male Irish at least, the sexual urge is either sublimated by religion, dissipated in sport, or drowned in drink. <laughs> And in the case of one very distinguished Irishman, that was the poet Patrick Kavanagh, it was probably a combination of all three. 
because he was very fond of his jar, he was also quite orthodox in his religious uh, practices, and he was uh, a footballer. Well, he was a goalkeeper in Monaghan. Uh, I don't know how that would wait. But anyway, he does describe in his book, Terry Flynn, how the rural bachelors of his youth would drag themselves along to the mission when the redemptorists hit town with the fire and the brimstone. And they go in there, they sit there very reluctantly with the cap on the knee and the bald heads shining in the candlelight. Celibate and 60. <laughs> and as the missioner warned to his team and castigated them and reviled them for their impurity and their promiscuity and their general depravity, they would stiffen with pride. <laughs> So that, as Kavanagh says at the end of the sermon, they left the chapel fit to bull cows. <laughs> Which, uh, we must presume, was not the object of the exercise. There's a certain characteristic which has been ascribed to the English by the writer Stephen Potter, which he calls one-upmanship. But we in this country, of course, have been practicing that for donkeys generations, from time immemorial, actually. But we don't use that kind of highfalutin terminology. We simply call it being way ahead hereby. I want to give you a few examples of that uh, little attribute, starting, needless to say, in Dublin. I see am. Wow. Remember that pound I give you yesterday? What about the powder? Well, it's the rarer time to go have a bike. No, I'm not finished with it. <laughs> what do you mean you're not finished with it? You're a rotten woman. I've seen you putting a wad of notes into your pocket a minute ago. No, that was the children's allowance money. <laughs> sure, I have to bring that home. Children's allowance money. Sure, only for me you wouldn't have that either. <laughs> And you'll find it among soccer followers. Two men coming out of Milltown. Well, they won't be coming out anymore with us. <laughs> Unfortunately, they won't be going in either. But what do you think of the new blog? He's great, great head, and he? He's great head, and he? He's great, great left leg, too, and he? He's great sweeper, and he? he? Bends the ball beautifully, and he? Didn't he? He's a bleeding waster. <laughs> Oh, you're very prejudiced. I guarantee you, in a year's time, a hundred thousand wouldn't buy him. You're dead right, and I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose the classic example of this was the lady in Moore Street who sold oranges in the days before the introduction of decimalization. And uh, she was approached one day by an American visitor uh, who said, "Ah." Oh, those are beautiful oranges you got there, ma'am. What? <laughs> oh, the oranges are oh, gorgeous, lovely, juicy jaffas. Here, do you want to feel them? They're beautiful. Oh, they're lovely. Oh, they're... Well, he said, uh, what are you charging for them? Three shillings a dozen, sir. And he said, what's that in dollars? Twenty dollars, sir. <laughs> So not being, not being very well up in the currency, he, he paid her the $20. If you believe that, you believe anything, but he went off with his bag of oranges, but when he opened them, he discovered he only got 11 oranges, and he came back and he said, pardon me, ma'am, but I, <laughs> I guess uh, we got a slight misunderstanding here, because I reckon even in Ireland, a dozen <laughs> means 12. That's right, I are quite right, a dozen, 12, that's very good, very, very accurate. <laughs> Boy, have you got a problem? Well, he said, actually, I, I only got 11 oranges. That's right, so one of them was bad. I turned it away for you. <laughs> and, of course, you'll find this kind of thing all over the place, even in the West, even in Galway, even among the most innocent in Galway, because there is a lot of innocence in Galway. <laughs> Mind you, you have to look for it. 
You'll probably find oil first, but anyway. <laughs> there were two girls coming out of a, a marriage guidance course in Galway, one of whom knew everything, and the other one knew nothing. And the one who knew nothing says to the one who knew everything, she says, A tractor. <laughs> were you able to follow all that? Of course I was. Why? Well, she said, Tell me, are you a virgin? Oh, no, not yet. And um, you'll find it, I suppose, in the Midlands, a uh, classic example of it. Midland people are often described as phlegmatic, which is another word for thick. Um, <laughs> and people say, they have a phrase in Athlone to describe someone who's very thick. They say, he's as thick as the man from Cousin. Cousin is a little village on the edge of the town. And the phrase originated many years ago when a patient escaped from the mental home around Christmas time. And he was running around in the frost and the snow, stark naked. And they had a, a posse looking for him because even in that part of the world, that is considered unusual behavior. <laughs> and the local sergeant was leading the search party and they met these two men from Coosin coming in, trudging into early mass with the collars up or you know, trudging through the snow and the frost. And the sergeant said, uh, did you see anybody back the road, lads? Huh? No. No, we see no one. And the second said, well, how about your mum was seen lying in the ditch? <laughs> what? You saw somebody like we did, yeah, about a mile back the road. Lying in the ditch, not a stitch on him. <laughs> Same as the day he come into the world, he was. <laughs> and did you speak to him? I said, sure, all I said, well, hardy man. <laughs> And, of course, they, they hardly come much, much thicker than that. But um, it's the kind of thing you'll find everywhere. I mean, uh, this would depend a lot on your knowledge of Irish drinks and so on. But uh, there was a lady, an American journalist, she was doing a survey on racial attitudes in Ireland. And she went into this pub in Dundalk and she said, uh, I'm doing this survey on racial attitudes right here and uh, I have been told, and I would welcome your comment on this, that Dundalk people are very anti-Semitic. <laughs> said, I don't think that's true. <laughs> Wouldn't agree. It's not that they're anti-Semitic, they just prefer to taste the McArdles. <laughs> And it is inevitable that when we come to this kind of thing, we have to visit the county of Cavan, which is uh, the home of thrift and one-upmanship and keeping ahead of the posse and all that. And it has been said that uh, if a space mammal dropped into a Cavan farmer's kitchen, he'd know he was in Cavan. Because there'll be poor man eating his dinner out of a drawer. And then when he'd see you coming, oh, hello there, how are you? <laughs> I asked a friend of mine in Calvin, because I have one, um, <laughs> if he hasn't been deported, but I, as I said, I hope you don't mind me telling that story. Not at all, no fire ahead. You're always welcome for to have a laugh at my expense. <laughs> for it's the only thing you'll ever have at my expense. <laughs> and the day I asked him, he was actually stripping wallpaper. And I said, oh, I see you're decorating. He said, no, we're moving. <laughs> The finest, the finest example of that goes back to the days, again, we're going back to prehistory practically, to the days before the introduction of artificial insemination. I mean, on farms. Uh, 
And uh, I mean, any bull will tell you that it was not a good idea. <laughs> and if cows had the vote, they wouldn't have gone for it either. But in those days, this small farmer in that area uh, hired a pedigree bull from the Department of Agriculture. And several days after the bull should have been brought back, there was no sign of it. So the inspector was sent out to find out what was going wrong. And he managed with great difficulty to locate the farm. And he had to climb over ditches and boulders and brambles and God knows what else. And he finally found himself in a rocky field where to his horror he saw this pedigree bull, this premium bull that had cost all that money, yoked to a plough. <laughs> and there was the farmer behind him cracking a whip. <laughs> Go along there, you bugger, you. <laughs> I'll show you me fine bio that there's more in life than romance. <laughs> and this, unfortunately, is only true, true, but, um... <laughs> There's another man in that area who had a prize boar which did the necessary for the neighbor's sows and the money went into his back pocket and everybody was happy. Not the boar's back pocket, his own back pocket. <laughs> and everybody was happy and until the department found out about it again, the inspector was sent out to warn him and he said, you'll have to register that boar boar. You'll have to take out the papers and pay the license fees and charge according to the schedule of charges laid down by the department regulations for services of this nature. He said, all right, all right, I don't want to have any more of that whole rubbish, I'll do it. So he went in and he paid all the license fees, filled all the forms and he came back with his license. He was now, everything was above board and according to Cocker. And there was one of the neighbours waiting with a sow. So he went to the sty and he led the old boar across the yard and the boar promptly lay down on the ground and went fast asleep. Come on, get up. Get up and do your work, come on. <laughs> Will you get up, you whore? Come on. <laughs> so he turned to the neighbour and he says, Well, good God, isn't that typical? He's a civil servant now, he doesn't want to do nothing. <laughs> But then we, we move a little further south, of course, we're coming nearer to my own part of the world. We come to Cork. And one of the things that people don't understand about Cork, of course, is that it suffers from uh, an inferiority complex. <laughs> Amazing how nobody will ever believe that. But uh, I don't mean in the Kerry sense, of course. A Kerry man with an inferiority complex is someone who thinks he's just as good as anybody else. <laughs> But this is another matter altogether. It's a municipal frame of mind and it arises when Cork compares itself to, um, to other places like Dublin, for instance, and notices certain deficiencies, such as the fact that Cork has no zoo of its own. Well, not one with railings around it, anyway. Uh, this... This deficiency was rectified when they, uh, when they opened the Wildlife Centre in Fulter Island in Cork Harbour. Now, I should explain that a wildlife centre is not quite the same thing as a disco. I mean, I'm, I'm just clarifying terms because people do get confused. I, mean, I have a friend who thinks that uh, the contraceptive lobby is the foyer of the Burlington Hotel, but... <laughs> which it is, but I mean... Um, this, this other um, thing was this, this uh, wildlife centre in Cork Harbour had as its nucleus three polar bears. There was a mammy bear, a daddy bear and a baby bear. And one day the baby bear came to his mother and he said, uh, Mammy! Because they'd been in Cork a while at this stage. <laughs> mammy! Am I a polar bear? She said, of course you are, love. <laughs> so what else would you be? You're not getting water. You're not getting a complex about it, are you? No, 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 I was just wandering like, you was just wandering like. So uh, later on he came to his father and he said, Daddy, am I really a polar bear? <laughs> the father said, look, I heard you and I and your mother about that already. I'm fed up with it. Once in a while, get it into your head, you are a polar bear. That clear now? You are a polar bear. 
What do you want to know for, anyway? Because I'm f***ing frozen. <laughs> Man... A man went into uh, a tobacconist and the tobacconist said, Morning, can I help you? He said, You might be able to help me. I like, No, because I have a problem. <laughs> you see, every time I sneeze, You're an awful bitch. <laughs> uh, every time I sneeze, <laughs> I get very randy. He <laughs> said, what are you coming in to me for? <laughs> An ounce of snuff. And And as you know, ma'am, it doesn't work. But anyway, uh, another man was collecting unpaid bills for the Cork Examiner, and he called to this house and he said, uh, uh, Morning, I'm, I'm, the, what do you want, what do you want? And he said, Well, I'm from the Cork Examiner, actually, and I have a little bill for you. I'm sure you've overlooked it, but you, you, you do owe the Cork Examiner two pounds. I owe the Cork Examiner two pounds? For what? Well, he said it's for a non... Well, it's a little bill, actually. It's, uh, 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 let me see. Oh, yes, yes, it's for an ad, you know, a little classified ad. Uh, yes, yes, here we are. It's uh, um, lost and strayed. It's for a missing brindle pup. <laughs> Shag off, all right. Yes. <laughs> that dog came home on his own. <laughs> And um, there was a pub that I used to frequent in my distant youth uh, for the simple reason that it opened at 7 a.m., which is a good time to start the day. It was a markets pub. And the scene there at that hour of the morning would be very quiet and very controlled and peaceful. And uh, just a couple of old fellas there like to be uh, counting the bubbles in the pint. <laughs> Being very gracious and quiet. And one morning when there were two of them just there, enjoying themselves. The door opened and brother, brother, county kind of chap came in. Morning. Hello there, lads. <laughs> a little, uh, can I have a little gin and tom, please? Yes, yes. No ice for lemon. No, no, no. But I'd like to use your phone, if I may. Thank you very much. Uh, hello? Hello, is that you, George? This is Robbie here. I have very bad news, I'm afraid. I can't go hunting today. Oh, no, no, I'm fine. No, it's the mayor. Yes, yes, unfortunately, yes, the mayor's fetlock trouble of some kind. Yes, yes, yes. All right, God bless. Bye-bye. Most unfortunate, isn't it? Yes, most unfortunate. All right, God bless. Bye-bye. And he hung up. And the two alphas have been listening to this. <laughs> you know that? Who's your man? <laughs> I don't know. He don't drink here at all, anyhow. Are you going hunting today? <laughs> what? <laughs> Are you going hunting today? Oh, no, I can't. I can't. Most unfortunate. <laughs> Most unfortunate, I can't. The ferret have the flu. <laughs> I 
And then we, we, go f we go a little further west and we get to Kerry. Now, when you get to Kerry, of course, uh, there's another ingredient that enters into all this equation, and that is a great reluctance to offend, a great willingness to see the other man's point of view and to help him out of his dilemma, if he's in a dilemma, and if not, to put him in one. But <laughs> like the man who was drinking after hours in, in a pub in List Hall and the guards raided the place, so he ran upstairs and he hid in one of the beds in the bedrooms. And when the sergeant went upstairs to investigate, he saw this figure in the bed, he went over, he whipped the blankets off the bed and he said, what the hell do you think you're doing there? With your good suit on you. <laughs> and your boots on you in bed. He said, yes, I didn't know. Guilty but insane, I suppose. <laughs> now the man was doing a crossword in Tralee. He called his neighbour. He said, Make there's a four letter word here. He said, I want no four letter words or you know that kind of filth. No, it's in the crossword. A four letter word. Old MacDonald had a dash, full stop. Firm, of course, you eat it. Old MacDonald had a firm. Oh, yeah. How do you spell it? E I E I O. There was a teacher in that part of the world who had two little boys in his class from the same family. So we will assume that they were brothers. And uh, while. What puzzled him about them was that they never arrived at school together. One was always five or six minutes later than the other. And one day, when one of them almost made it in time, he said, Oh, my God, you nearly made it. You're only five minutes late. Nevertheless, you are late. What kept you? I was having my breakfast. <laughs> I see. And what did you have for your breakfast? I had a boiled egg. <laughs> oh, all right, sit down. Five minutes later, his brother arrived. He said, oh, the whole family's here now. Very kind of you, son. Very kind of you to turn up. You're late. What kept you? I, I was having my breakfast. And what did you have for your breakfast? I had a boiled egg. Said your brother had a boiled egg. He could be here five minutes ago. Had I a spoon? Had I? <laughs> And of course, they are very mechanically minded in that part of the world. The man on his way into the garage, his neighbour called me, said, you're going into the garage, he said, I am. He said, would you, would you do me a favour? He said, would you ever ask him if by any chance there would have such a thing as a cylinder head gasket? Will you try and remember this now? Because it's very important. Would they have a cylinder head gasket? for a blue van. <laughs> I was giving a, he was giving a neighbour a lift home in the blue van one evening. <laughs> and he took a corner very sharp. <laughs> nearly killed us. He said, if you want to drive like that, the least you could do was blow the horn before I got on the car. Oh, what are you talking about? I often blew it before. There was never anyone there. <laughs> well, he said, the way you're driving is a disgrace. He said, you're a minister's society. You shouldn't be allowed out on the road. He said, you're tearing the arse out of the engine. He said, you'll... He said, that no, no piece of machinery could put up with that. He said, don't you worry about this old jalopy at all. Don't you worry at all, boy. Twelve years I have her on the road now, never an ounce of trouble. And do she bought an aisle? She would if she got it. <laughs> um, we, uh, we are, uh, of course, uh, m one of my own favourite stories of that region, I suppose, was the... Uh, the sergeant who was going around uh, checking on dog licenses. This was in the days before uh, recent troubles and so on. Very little to trouble them except radio licenses and dog licenses and that sort of thing. And he was checking on dog licenses and this farmer spotted him so he ran into the wife and he said, Mara, Mara, where's the dog? Where's the dog? 
she had has the matter with you. She was sitting in front of the fire herself with the old flash, old fashioned uh, flowing black skirt and the crocheted uh, shawl and that, and she was knitting away peacefully. And uh, he said, the bloody sergeant going around, he said, he's looking for dog licenses. Shall we have no dog license? She said, well, you take it easy. Calm yourself down. She said, the dog is over there behind the settle. Bring him over here to me. So he brought the dog over and she put the dog under her skirt. She held it between her ankles and she went on then calmly knitting unaware that the dog's tail was now sticking out under her shoe <laughs> and wagging away there, you see, merrily. Uh, when the sergeant came to the door, she said, Oh, sergeant, God knows we haven't seen you in an age. How are you? How's herself? We're not in any trouble, are we? No, not at all. No, no, I just want to look at your dog license. What dog license? What the hell will we want a dog license for? Shall we have no dog? <laughs> I could, I could have sworn you had a dog. No, 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 we have no dog. We never had a dog. Never had a dog. We never even had a pup. <laughs> <laughs> well, ma'am, I have news for you. You're going to have one very shortly. <laughs> um, and... To finish up our little tour of Kerry, we have my own favourite story of that region. The man who's being shown around the lakes and the mountains by the guide. And he said, do you see that mountain over there? No. That no is Cabin Tool. That no is the highest mountain in Ireland. As a matter of fact, it's the highest mountain in Kerry. <laughs> it's 3,414 feet high. And the Americans said, well, I, I don't doubt what you say, but uh, that one over there looks higher to me. I will... No, Cabin Tool was always the highest. <laughs> well, up to last week, it was anyway, like. I mean, I know we did a lot of rain, but Jesse wouldn't have washed the top off it. <laughs> and I go to the guards now, or the teachers, or anyone, they'll all give you the same story. Cabin Tool is the highest mountain in Ireland. No question about that at all. Statistically speaking, or any other... No, he said, I don't doubt that. I merely say that that one looks higher to me. Hmm. Yeah, I never noticed that before. Mm. <laughs> Because you see, the snag about Cabin Tool is just kind of down in the holler. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, to get you out of your, uh, out of your mystification, the motivational force really is a sense of place because Irish people are obsessed with the sense of place the first question any Irish man will ask you if he meets you in Honolulu or Hong Kong or Camden Town once he knows you're Irish is what county man are you <laughs> because he feels if he knows where you're from he knows what you're like now this is a completely unsustainable generalization but some people suffer from it more than others I suppose the greatest victims are the unfortunate natives of the county of Cavan <laughs> Mainly because of me, let it be said. But, um, <laughs> and I would like to thank the people of Cavan here and now for affording me and my family a good living over many years. <laughs> but uh, they do have the reputation of being somewhat ungenerous, as in the aforementioned phrase, main Cavan bastards. But <laughs> um, this is, it's not for me to say whether this is a deserved reputation or not, although I do. Um, <laughs> but I will give you a couple of examples of what it is that gives them this reputation. There was a man went into Cabin Town on the market day and he was in there in the square. Well, it's not a square anymore, actually. It's, uh, it's a triangle. Because <laughs> they refused to pay the rates on the fourth side. <laughs> but... He was browsing around among the stalls there and he found this knick-knack stall and he picked up a pair of spectacles, a pair of second-hand glasses and he put them on. But God, he said, them as powerful specs. God, if you could see a towel with them, the grace. So he said to the man, he said, how much are they? He said, oh, they're very good value. They're only 40p. Oh, my God, that's great. Oh, it's 40p. Is that for the two now? <laughs> My God, a good value right now, I'll take them. So he went home to the missus and he said, Hey, what do you think of me? 
Because I told you that years ago. <laughs> no, but what do you think of me when it says, oh, my God, you got new specs, and they suit you very well. They, they look great on you. They make you very intelligent looking. <laughs> you look like Alan Dukes if you were four feet taller. <laughs> and had a fag hanging out of your mouth. <laughs> Uh, the suit you very well, but she said, uh, take them off now and don't be wasting them looking at unimportant things. <laughs> um, <laughs> another man was unlucky enough to have lost the job and he was outside one of the hotels there doing a bit of discreet begging and he approached this businessman. And he said, you know, the job is gone, things is bad and that, like, the other chance you could give us a few shillings, you know, but do it cute, you know, don't let everybody know our business, like, and don't let anyone see you, don't let anyone see you slipping me a pound, you know. <laughs> he says, oh, you needn't worry. <laughs> no one will see me. <laughs> so he threw a blank there, and, um, Got the next man on his way and he explained the story again. He said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Unfortunately, I don't have any money on me, but um, um, uh, will you be here tomorrow? Because he, uh, oh, of course I will. So I'll be here all day, every day. Nothing else to do. Oh, well, in that case, I'll see you tomorrow. Is that all right? Yes, I suppose it'll have to be. Jesus, I hate giving credit. <laughs> Another man had, um, <clears throat> he went into a pub and he, he ordered a wee black bush and they gave him the black bush. He called the barman back and said, here, here, come here. I ordered the black bush, I didn't order what's in it. <laughs> said, what do you mean? I didn't order the wasp. <laughs> if I want a wasp, I'll order a wasp. <laughs> but I didn't order it. Is, do you want me to take the wasp over? Is that what you're trying to say? Of course it's that. You don't expect me to take the wasp over. <laughs> So the barman has a go, and a big last of on the tum now. <laughs> well, he has a dive into the half on. He manages to harpoon the wasp. Takes him out and has a look at him. He turns to him and he says, Jeez, for all this, what a drunk on ya. Yeah. people of course also get reputations cork people are allegedly very cute which may explain why I'm up here and you're not but um, <laughs> there was a man came up from Cork for the All-Ireland final I won't say what year it was because I don't want to dwell on recent unhappy events but he went for a meal out he had his little boy with him about six years old because he brought him up so that he would know his way around in later life and um, <laughs> They went for a meal and they were joined at the table by a stranger. And uh, I mean, he was a stranger to them. I mean, he wasn't a stranger in Dublin because he was a Dublin man. But the point is, anyway, he came and he sat by them. And the uh, boy looked at him for a long time and finally said, Excuse me, sir, are you from Cock? He got a kick under the table from his father when he came out. He said, What was that dead about? You nearly broke me fucking shin. <laughs> I only asked the man a question. He said, that was a very rude thing you done in there. Very rude. Most unmannerly. You should never ask anybody if he's from Cork. Because if he is, he'll tell you anyway. <laughs> and if he's not, you shouldn't be embarrassing him. <laughs> so, uh... <clears throat> Who's winning? But anyway, um, <laughs> other people, of course, are even cuter, if that were possible. And you can guess where they are. And Kerry. And I would have to concur with the verdict that they are cute whores. But anyway, uh, I admire Kerry people tremendously because I'm half Kerry myself. I won't tell you which half. <laughs> But anyway, uh, I admire their great ability to make a little go a long way. 
because, uh, for instance, even in the racing game they get away with it. They have three of the most prestigious race meetings in Ireland, in Killarney, Listowel and Tralee, despite the fact that in the entire Kingdom of Kerry there is nobody who trains horses, nobody who breeds horses. There are no jockeys living there. <laughs> well, not ones that ride horses, anyway. And, um, and yet they have these three prestigious race meetings, and uh, they also have the biggest and the best of all beauty contests the Rose of Tralee, and there isn't a decent looking bird in Tralee, so <laughs> see, they really get away with murder. But uh, one man that I admired immensely was a man in Tralee who used to race greyhounds. I don't mean that he ran against greyhounds, he used to actually uh, enter them for races, and he saw an ad in the trade paper for a litter of champion pups. And the going rate at the time was 50 pounds per pup, so he sent 50 pounds to the man in Dublin who was selling the pups, and when he was sending on the pup, he went up to Houston Station, and just as he was putting in the basket with the pup in it, he had a last check. He looked in, and to his horror, he saw that the pup was dead. He said, oh, my Jesus, what am I going to do now? <laughs> I'm after drinking the bleeding money. <laughs> ah, I'll send it on him. I should he might know. Ah, he would. He'd know the difference. Ah, yeah. <laughs> But he blames you, he he'll think of doing on the train, I'll chance it anyway. So he sent on the pup, and to his astonishment he got no sort of whiz-bang of any description. There was no phone call, no telegram, nothing. No reaction, whatever. And he was so intrigued by this, that the next time he was in the carry area, he called to see this man. He walked into him and he said, uh, Hello there, how's it going? <laughs> Who have I? <laughs> How is the pup doing? Oh, you're the man that sent the pup, hello. Oh, well, well, well. I tell you next time, I think you know about that pup. He said, didn't that pup arrive dead? <laughs> and I was a bit taken aback, like, I mean, I know you're a Dublin man, but Jesus, you wouldn't be that big a crook, like, to send me a dead pup through the post. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, I was thinking maybe like that to die on the ten, that I should so see I.E., like, but sure, I'd be dead myself before I'd get it out of them. <laughs> And then I was a bit embarrassed too, you see, because like I was boasting a lot about it in the pub. You know the way you'd be blowing your call about getting this new pup and so on. Like, and uh, I knew there'd be an awful lot of questions. So I said to a man in the station, I said, hang on to that. I'll be back for that tomorrow morning, you know, just hang on to that. And I had to think it out, you see. I went back to the pub anyway, and they were all questions, all the gog. Where's the pub? Where's the famous pub? I said, he didn't come. He's not coming till tomorrow. He went on the train. And uh, I'm just as pleased anyway, because I'm getting a bit too old for all that greyhound stuff, you know. I think when that pup arrives that I'll sell it. Of course, who would I sell it to? Who would be able to afford it around here? <laughs> Still, I suppose we could raffle it. <laughs> so to cut a long story short in here, I raffled the pup. I sold 50 tickets at two pound a skull. I went for the one and I said, go up in the morning and collect your pup. Well, I was in the middle of my breakfast the following morning. He came tearing into me. Come here to me, he says. That pup was dead. Oh, Christ, says I am very sorry. And I gave him back his two quid and everyone was happy. <laughs> but, um... <clears throat> I don't always get away with it. This is a historic story, in fact. It goes back to the time of the French Revolution. There were three men arrested in Paris and they were charged with counter-revolutionary activities. There were an Englishman, a Scotsman, and a Kerry man. Kerry, for the purposes of this story, being an independent state, to the great relief of everybody else. But anyway, they were charged and they were sentenced to death. And on the morning of the execution, the executioner came to them and he said, Messieurs, I have to inform you that according to the laws of revolutionary France, you are entitled to a choice in the manner of your death. You may elect to die bravely with your throat to the blade of the guillotine like this, or like a coward with your neck to the blade like this, he said. Uh, which do you choose, monsieur, he said to the Englishman. He said, oh, I, I think I can take it on the chin, oh boy. Uh, 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 let, let, let's get it over with. Uh, messy old job you've got, isn't it? Oh, uh, well, lack of education, I suppose. Oh, oh, oh. Anyway. 
So he put his head on the block and they pulled the lever down, came the blade, brrrr, it stopped a foot from the Englishman's throat and the executioner said, Monsieur, when this occurs, we regard it as an intervention of divine providence. Consequently, you are free to go. So uh, he said, oh, thank you very much. Awfully kind of you. Have a nice day, chaps. Bye-bye. And off he went. And then they called the Scot and he said, how do you choose to die, Monsieur? He said, I'm as brave as any bloody Englishman. I can take it on the chin just as good as any Swissner. All right. Come on, let's get away. Let's stop flapping a bit. Come on, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> so they pulled the lever down, came the blade, brrr, it stopped the foot from the Scotsman's toe. And once more, the executioner said, Monsieur, once more, divine providence has intervened. You are free to go. And he went off, and then he called the carryman, and he said, How do you elect to die, monsieur? I can check it on the chin just as good as he. <laughs> on the schmig, or on the nose, or on the forehead, all the one to me. <laughs> what difference does it make? I won't be around much longer anyway. The main thing is that you have a job to do. <laughs> and you should be comfortable and happy, no? In that angle, all right for you? Fair enough, so flake away whenever you like. <clears throat> Hold it, stop, 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 stop! I think I see what's making it stick. <laughs> Other people, of course, other people, of course, think they know what makes us tick as well. Like, there was an English actor being interviewed by a gay barn one night, and he said, he described what he thought was an awfully funny thing that happened to him in Dublin. So I was in this hotel, I was having a shower, I suppose, about half past four in the afternoon, because that apparently is when they wash themselves. And um, <laughs> he said, the knock on the door, it was one of the porter chaps. And I said, yes, what is it? And he said, I have a telegram for your thought, he said in this marvellous Irish brogue. And I said, well, it's a bit awkward, I'm in the shower. Can't you slip it under the door? And he said, I can't, it's on a tray. <laughs> Which she found very amusing, as indeed it is, but what he really needed was a translation because when the porter said, I can't, it's on a tray, what he meant was, I will in me arse and go without me tip. <laughs> <laughs> some of you may recall a film that I was involved in some years back called Murphy's Stoke, uh, which concerned a betting coup carried out by some uh, Cork people, oh. indeed some Irish people involved as well, but... They, um, they got this horse called Gay Future, which they ran in an obscure track in the north of England, and they stood to win £330,000 of the London bookies' money. And they were only, in fact, uh, prevented from collecting this money by a technicality. They were in jail. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but they did manage to prove that it could be done, and they offended the sensibilities of the racing fraternity in England to the extent that some of them decided they would have their revenge. And they got together and they got a horse and they decided they would pull a little stroke in Ireland, a little coup. And they came over with the horse in fairly decent condition. And uh, then they had to find, this was the most difficult part of their entire enterprise, they had to find somewhere in Ireland a bent jockey. Uh, <laughs> this is not a sexual allusion, it is um, a racing term. But anyway, they, they surged high up and low down and low down, they found one. Um, <laughs> they found him in Waterford, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, we, we want, uh, we, we have this horse and we want you to uh, sort of ride him in this race. We've entered him in a five horse race, but obviously we don't want you to win because I would tip our hand and we have bigger plans for later on and all that. And he said, oh, I know what you mean, yeah. I know what you want, because I've done this kind of work before. I've uh, come very highly recommended, yeah. <laughs> 
They said yes, yes. So anyway, they said, if you brought him in third of the five, that would be all right. So he did what he was told, and they were having a little discussion now. They said, how do you feel? He went, well, oh, he's a great horse. He's a great horse. Christ is a great, great piece of stuff. Oh, Christ is a great piece of stuff. So he nearly pulled the, he pulled the arms out of me. Did you not see? My wrist was nearly pulled out of me. I was going around there, he marvelous horse. Wonderful piece of Wonderful. And you feel he could have won? Of course he could have won. So I was holding him back the whole way around. I was holding him back. I couldn't. Go. And they say, you feel he could have beaten the other two horses horses in front. Of course he could. You'd be at the shite on him. You're joking me. He would run him into the ground and no problem whatsoever. The only trouble is I'm not too sure that he'd beat the two behind me. <laughs> so, there are other sports I suppose we shouldn't even, uh, we shouldn't even mention. There was a man of my own age, disposition, background, tastes, whatever you like. Anyway, he decided to go to London. He was from Cork. And he decided to go to London for a dirty weekend <laughs> before it was all gone, like. And um, <laughs> he went into this pub. Needless to say, the barman was Irish. But as he approached the bar, he saw this lady sitting on her own, very attractive-looking girl. And he said, Mmm, I fancy her, no, very nice. So he went up to the bar and he said, I'll have a pint of bitter and... Uh, I think the lady's having a gin and tonic, is that right? And the man said, listen, old soul, I want to mark your car to you. She's bad news. You know what I mean? Keep clear of her. No, 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 he said, I just want to get her a gin and tonic. Well, he said, I put my cards on the table. She is a lesbian. He said, I don't worry about things like that for heaven's sake. Come on, give me the drink. So he took the pint and took the gin and tonic, went over, put it in front of the girl and said, well, my dear, and how are they all in lesbia? <laughs> So there is no, uh, no prejudice where I come from. But um, one of the sports I want to talk about is golf. Now, golf is not a game that has been played all that long by the plain people of Ireland, and it causes a great deal of distress, domestic uh, upsets. And uh, one woman in Dublin for many years was a golf widow. And when her husband finally passed on, strangely enough, uh, she began to miss him. And she decided she would like to get in touch with him again, so she went to the spiritualists and she asked, was there any possibility that they could do the needful? And they said, well, it could be very harrowing. And they said, Would you, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I'd like to get in touch with him, because I seen very little of him when he was alive, you know. <laughs> So I was out playing golf, now the main, and they said, well, all right. So uh, they did the necessary, and they tapped the tables and joined hands, and then they said, we've made contact, Mrs. Jones, we've made contact. So then she didn't know how to start the conversation. She said, uh, can you hear me, Ben? <laughs> said, oh, yeah, great reception today, very clear. <laughs> and she said, well, tell me, what do you do all day, you know, where you are? I said, oh, well, I wake up in the morning, and have a bit of sex, like. <laughs> And then I might have uh, something to eat, and then out on the course. A couple of hours going around the course, and maybe more sex. And uh, then lunchtime, I come like have a nibble, and I might have something to eat as well. And then uh, <laughs> back out on the course for another couple of hours, and uh, maybe more sex. And then, of course, coming towards dusk, there'd be an awful lot more sex. And she said, Bill, I hate to interrupt you having a good time and all that. She said, but uh, are you in heaven? I said, no, I'm a rabbit in Port Marnock. <laughs> and, <laughs> see, one of the things about, in recent times anyway, I have to explain this is, uh, this is the educational aspect of the program again. Uh, there's a certain phrase that is used in Cork, or a term which is used, the word langers, which describes a state to which most of you are aspiring, and indeed those of you who have arrived, congratulations. <laughs> it means being pissed, or, um, or on the way to getting a little tipsy or one, and this word langers is, has become part of the common parlance of the country, but and quite acceptable even in, in recent, in, in sort of fairly uh, civilized uh, or uh, polite society. But the singular of this word, langers, is not quite so acceptable. In fact, <laughs> it is regarded as well, rather a crude expression because uh, the word langer um, 
describes, uh, shall we say, a portion of the male anatomy, and uh, any man is only entitled to have one. And if he has more than one, he's on his way to being a millionaire. But anyway, <laughs> it does describe this portion of the, of the anatomy, and I don't want to dwell on it, but uh, except to state that it provides tremendous value to people in Cork who listen to golf commentaries, because there's a German, uh, <laughs> German golfer named Bernhard Langer. And, uh, when they hear, when they listen to Cork to uh, golf commentaries and they hear about Langer's this and Langer that and <laughs> Langer the other, you see, they, it, it, well, it has a double meaning which uh, increases the enjoyment of the commentary. But this is even more enjoyable in a way and a bit puzzling when you get American commentators and the same golfer is involved as, say, in the Ryder Cup and they insist, the Americans <laughs> insist on calling him not Langer, but Longer. <laughs> and I think there's a Freudian reason here why so many young Cork men emigrate to the United States. <laughs> because if when you get there, your Langer becomes longer, well... <laughs> it is an added attraction, you must admit. How is Charlie? How are you going to get out of that one? I tell you. But anyway, um, that's beside the point. Um, we want to get back to want to get back to the to 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 golf again. And uh, as I say, it's not a game that has been played all that long by the plain people of Ireland. And in fact, it's in within recent within living memory that a man of my own sort of kind, of decent, honest, hardworking. <laughs> plain, ordinary Joe Soap, managed to get into a golf club in Cork. And there he was one day, having a practice round on his own. Because no one else would talk to him. And there he was, scuttling balls up into trees, out over ditches, railway lines, duck ponds, hen houses, telegraph poles, everywhere about the fairway. And one of the members happened to spot him. And he came over and he said, I see you're having your little problems. <laughs> Don't worry about that at all. That's a phase we all go through. And I said, I was watching you now very carefully. You know, and your stance is absolutely perfect. And your swing is copybook. And watching you, I've come to the conclusion that your main problem is the ball. The ball, oh yeah. <laughs> Never tired of that. No, 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 I'm perfectly serious because, you see, I dabble a bit in psychology. I'm a bit of a psychologist and it's all psychological, you know, it's all up there, it's all in the mind. And you know what I find very therapeutic? Very well. Well, very helpful, if you like. I find it's great therapy to play a few holes without any balls. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, to be cheap, but all right, like, yeah. <laughs> No, 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 I'm perfectly serious because it's all, it's all therapeutic, you see. And I'll, I'll, I'll show my, I'll demonstrate my point to you now. We'll play the next couple of holes together without any balls. Now, first of all, I take my ball, of course I don't have any ball. Oh, I know that, like, you have no ball. You have no ball, but you're going to put it down and hit it, like, psychologically. Yeah, well, you get the idea, yes, now. And, uh, and you'll keep an eye on it. What? Right? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, feel no. Okay, no, no, here we go. Ho, 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 ho. Ooh look at that for a look at that for a tee shot. <laughs> By sicting the fairway. You thought I did. Jesus, a great shot. <laughs> Marvellous shot. Now let's see what you can do. Oh, if you're not... <coughs> Excuse me, no, the old underpants kids, I'll take them. Well, it's all right, I suppose. It's uh... Well, it's a worker anyway, by God. It's running on there, bobbling along nicely. <laughs> We're like two peas in a pot up there in the middle of the fair. We've got now, we play our second shot. And I want you to keep an eye on this because I have a feeling I'm going to drop this right in the heart of the green, all right? <laughs> you keep an eye, oh, I will, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, here we go. Ho, ho, ho. Woohoo! Look at the trajectory. Heart in the green, what did I tell you? Running towards the pin. It's in the hole! <laughs> you saw it, I did. Jesus, a great shot. <laughs> a marvelous shot. Now, for pity, do I hate to have to tell you this, but you lose the hole. 
Well, how do you make that out? That was my fucking bar, you head. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> as we um, reach the end of uh, what might be called our tether, <laughs> I want to tell you one thing. I've always had a secret ambition to be a country and western singer. Now, unfortunately, there are little problems. Uh, first of all, I can't sing. But that never stopped anybody else. Um, <laughs> there are other problems. There's the question of the accent in which country and western songs should be sung in this country. Well, you know, if you're last in the road, Castle Blaney, for a couple of hours, you might get that. You'd pick it up, maybe. It's the only thing you would pick up. But anyhow, all of you were to stand at the four roads to Glen Amadi. You get a cold in your ass in this weather. But <laughs> even all these things can be overcome uh, because, uh, you know, they're all making comebacks now. Even Larry Cunningham is back on the road because he qualifies for the free travel now. And <laughs> <laughs> but my, my main problem... My main problem was the song that I wanted to sing, which is a song called Gentle On My Mind. Now, this is a very difficult song to learn because um, the lines vary in length as between one verse and the next, mainly because Dean Martin was pissed when he made the record. But <laughs> it doesn't help when you want to put it together. And I want to uh, give you my version of it, which I had to make because I couldn't get around to the other one. Gentle on my mind. It's knowing that you knew I must have guessed you realized I knew that you were now a liberated woman. <laughs> With feelings and opinions far more complex than the gentle hand of nature had designed. And that has caused me to feck off about the universe, just versifying and portrifying and strumming. Cause a new as sure as eggs is eggs, I have a for a fact, I'm told you have another gent upon your mind. <laughs> now I've been around the world and I declare to God, the travelling was ferocious. Be every class of carriage and contraption that the wit of man designed. And the rake of beard, the rare up, and the women, and the crack was only odious. <laughs> but sleeping in the backwoods, I could never get your memory, nor the streets of Talman fecking off me man. Now I could sing a song of love expressing my affection in a manner that would have you running with me to the parson. If I could only recollect with some exactitude how many f***ing syllables in his line. <laughs> but it's no one that had never find a hook to hang me high on. Not a chair to plank me ass on. <laughs> That's left me on my backside with the bitterest of memories and the splinters of this fence up me The thing about this is that uh, this game, this profession, this trade, whatever you call it, uh, of going around and doing shows in different parts of the country is that you become the recipient of uh, unsolicited contributions with a view to extending your repertoire. And I have several examples of this. My own favourite one is the man. The approach is usually the same. Come here, I have a great one for you. <laughs> Mind you, no, it's a bit on the dirty side, like, but uh, you'll be able to clean it up. I don't know where that comes from, but anyway, they get this impression. And one man in Tralee, or in the store, actually, he, my own favourite example is, Christ, I have a great one for you now. <laughs> and you're out of the bit in the blue side, like, but you'd have no trouble cleaning it up, like. And the great thing about this now, that is a true story. Like, it's absolutely true, because it happened, actually, to a cousin of my own. He was a relation of mine, actually. 
And for years, went he over in England, and he was working on the building. Why were you there for a year? And then didn't he have to emigrate? <laughs> and where did he head for only over to Canada? And I'd know what to Canada, you know, Wisconsin or, or uh, Ohio or maybe uh, Milwaukee. Anyway, some part of Canada. No, it was uh, Vancouver or uh, no, no, anyway, Ontario, I think. But anyway, his very first day, anyway, he walks into this public and the bell, and there was this Canadian, he up at the bell with the belly stuck out and the big lath in his hand, and he boasting and bragging and bullshitting out of 19 to the dozen. And you'll see, old man uh, took no notice, but he spotted my man coming in and he said, Oh, he said, uh, We got a Paddy here now. This guy, of course, is a poet. They are all poets. Why, right, Pat? And whatever you say yourself, you say, you're no wrong country, nothing to do with me, no, I'm not interfering with you one way or the other. Well, he said, ah, you are a poet, and he said, you're descended from kings, they're all descended from kings, and he said, I want you, I want you to listen, because he said, I'm a bit of a poet myself, and I want to recite a little patriotic poem, and I would like you to uh, respond in kind energy. Fair no, fair no, you know the way they go on, I mean, they all, uh, as bad as the Yanks, only they don't polish their shoes as often, but... <laughs> There he was anyway, and he said, well, he said, I listened to you, so the, the Canadian fellow picked up the glass and he said, here's to the bald-headed eagle of Canada. Ever free through our sky may he soar. He will guard and defend our freedom from the east to the western shore. He said, can you match that? Should I can try? <laughs> said, Here's to the wolfhound of Erin that guards both the rich and the poor. F you and your bald headed eagle, you cross eyed Canadian whore. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if anybody can clean that up. I'll buy it off and good night, God bless you all, safe home. Thank you very much.